Hello, I'm Marco from Kaspersky. Um, I decided to take um, a bit of a more general approach. That's where also the title is Noise and Signals. So we're walking through uh, some, from my perspective, interesting things, and I hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, first of all, that's the only slide for that. I'm with uh, the Global Research and Analysis team. I'm heading the European part. Um, our core competence is basically is we're doing investigations and research into APTs, targeted attacks, highly sophisticated attacks. So all kind of, I would say, the fun stuff, right? Um, and that's all what we're doing mostly. We're also looking into technologies and stuff like that. And out of that, I give you some insights. Um, before we start, I was thinking before, is that loud enough? Okay, uh, because here I don't have a monitor. Um, one thing which I find interesting is that um, people, especially in IT, are very creative. I mean, most of the people in my team are creative, have creative interests. Some do Besides that deep tech stuff, also video production, photos, all kind of art, music, um, so am I. Um, I also enjoy that stuff, which brings me back the connection as well with science fiction. Maybe some of you like Doctor Who. Who does? Someone likes Doctor Who? Ah, good. You know, the original episodes were released in 1963. That's, of course, long before when I was born. And I guess uh, true for many of you. But the interesting fact is not Doctor Who itself, but something which happened in 1958. And that is also kind of a core of this idea for giving this talk. So what happened in 1958? In uh, UK, the uh, so-called BBC radio workshop was created, where crazy people, interesting people, highly intelligent people, like Delia Derbyshire, Daphne Oram, um, which were very famous for very new kind of electronic music. We're talking about 1958. At that time, there were no synthesizers. There were no electronic music equipment at all. So these people were using everything which was possible out of the so-called test equipment environments like oscillators, filters, amplifiers. You're usually using in signal transmissions, TVs, all kind of that stuff. Combined with back then the recording devices, which are these reel-to-reel, -reel, the great-great-grandfathers of tapes uh, here to create electronic music. And back then, they were creating this very famous and new style intro of Doctor Who, which has this electronic touch, this atmospheric things. And as I myself were very interested into music, electronic music, not only listening, but also making for myself just as a hobby, um, I digged a lot into that. So I bought also a lot of crazy stuff. And one of the most outstanding are these so-called lock-in amplifiers. Uh, these are analog ones, very, very old from the 60s, whatever, 16-inch devices, and you have all these buttons and knobs and stuff to like adjust things. I use it for making music because they're really giving good sound, disturbing stuff and things like that. But originally in lab environments and in physics, they're used for so-called signal recovery. So imagine you have a signal which is completely trapped into noise and you want to get that signal out of this random noise from whatever, you use them to filter out the noise and you get the clean signal you can measure. So it's super interesting, very crazy stuff. It's not very heavy and I have quite a lot of them. So that's my big favorite one. There is uh, another one which is a two-phase vector yeah, crazy uh, lock-in amplifier. And I think especially something what these devices are doing, we're also trying to do. 
we dig through all of this noise, all of this random stuff which is going around and finding these signals, the interesting pieces, the stuff which is interesting to us, to our job, in order, of course, on our side, it's the good course, we're trying to protect people, we find the interesting malware, the advanced stuff, the complex stuff. So we're kind of human lock-in amplifiers, so to say. Well, setting the base, that's always interesting that we are all on the common ground. I'm not talking about this piece of noise stuff, but I think it's quite interesting. I really liked that screenshot. Who remembers that one? Very easy to see, right? Yeah, it's your PC is now stoned, though. That's from 1987. Back then, the IT security environment, especially in terms of threats and malware, was easy. I mean, there were some worms, some viruses, some Trojans, nothing super extended, nothing super crazy. You had like floppy disks as a transport uh, uh, medium. Nowadays, the situation looks completely different. We're generally talking more about the different levels of the threats we're seeing nowadays. You have crimeware stuff, which is like the biggest part. On top, the uh, more targeted, more complex professional groups behind that. And then the tip of the iceberg is 0.01%, the really, really advanced persistent threats, like the a um, lot of resources invested. And also the life cycle of all of that developed further and further over the years. From the beginning it was, oh yeah, there is a malware, you have the floppy in your computer, it infected your computer, dot, that's it. Um, now we're talking, depending on the different levels of completely different life cycles, which involves how a certain attacker or threat is going on and um, being active. You have the full cycle um, taken on by the more advanced actors in this field, and then just a few certain steps for the commodities uh, for the commodity threats because the time of investment, the resources you are investing in, is a measurement as well in terms of like um, the complexity, the targeted uh, kind of stuff on these threats. But let's dig through some noise. I was thinking starting first with IoT and embedded stuff because it's quite an interesting topic. I'm not talking about hacking the next webcam or the next router or whatever, but really trying to have a bit more focus on the intelligence side of things and observations. We have uh, internally a very huge, not internally, but externally, but it's a project we're doing, uh, a huge sensor network of honeypots, globally distributed everywhere. And this just gives you a brief overview about the amount of traveling we're getting into. We're talking here in the millions range, right? So four million, more sometimes seven million of hits, of malicious hits on our sensors. Um, they're completely passive, so it's not that they're actively trying to gather something, it's just passive censoring. And even with that, you have these numbers. So it's a lot of noise, right? Same for samples. That's the amount of unique, based on SHA-256, unique samples coming in per day. You have like usually a hundred, that's okay. Sometimes you have these spike, that was also interesting for me when I created this graph, um, but you have these certain time frames, especially where new modifications are introduced or new uh, attack methods uh, are tried out because some new vulnerabilities, some new uh, credential leaks or whatever happened, which are then incorporated into these more automated attacks. So the question is, we're of course not interested in just uh, the the one bazillions version of Mirai, that's okay for detection, but we're looking on the more interesting stuff. And especially in this field of IoT and embedded, what can we get out of there? There are very few interesting examples, not few, many. 
But first, we have to dig through all of the different platforms. That's just as a reference to, to make you feel and see what it really means working on that. All of these unique samples. It's not just only the Intel X86 for Linux, whatever dot, where you can easily handle. Now you have to take care about certain uh, uh, CPU architectures, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit, little endian, a big endian. It's not always easy because you have to somehow work with all of that. Um, but talking about the uh, examples, I added also uh, to some of them the platforms behind Black Energy. Very famous uh, BE version 2, um, which targeted uh, embedded devices. It's a very, it's a complex set of um, threat tool sets, so to say, which had quite some history behind. Uh, the first version, it was just a simple DDoS tool uh, called Tactus Crimeware. Uh, which was sold by the creator back then, 2007, for about $700. Uh, the group who bought it changed the code later on, added a lot of capabilities like these modules for ARM and MIPS. Uh, along that, they also added plugins, for example, for um, ICS systems. And um, later on, they continued. And in 2015, that's probably why and how many people at least heard of Black Energy was because of the attacks at the power plants in Ukraine, which caused uh, power outages for several hours in uh, a few regions in Ukraine. That was like a huge thing. Um, then in yeah, 2018, a uh, VPN filter appeared also this target into embedded routers. It's always a bit tricky to say like IoT, it's like embedded network devices, stuff like that. And interestingly, just based on a false implemented RC4 algorithm, uh, they had um, yeah, the, the wrong comparison integrated. And because of that same algorithm implemented wrongly in uh, black energy and in VPN filter, it was suggested that this is like the next the new malware uh, from the same group. Um, it has, also has like destructive capabilities and it uses a very interestingly more or less new kind of C2 communication. Instead of like plain DNS, they used EXIF uh, over DNS. So they were querying from websites pictures use the EXIF information hidden in there to derive the IP addresses of the C2 um, servers, which was quite interesting. Um, especially here, not only routers, but also on NAS devices, which is kind of nasty, of course, because many uh, businesses store all of their interesting and important data there. Um, followed later on by in 2019, that's something you probably also read nowadays quite often, Cyclop, uh, Cyclops Blink, uh, which recently was in the news targeting several hundreds of thousands of uh, specific routers of uh, one vendor, um, which is also seen as a successor of VPN filter. And additionally, it takes firewalls. So why do I tell you all of that? The interesting thing here is, as opposite to your regular computer and server, these things, you have less control about it. I mean, how many people really are working on the shells of a router? We're not talking about the big enterprise routers, but the small shitty ones, like the plastic ones. Not many, right? Because you have less control about it. So it's a foothold into the network. You have full control in most cases about the whole traffic going on. So you have sniffing, uh, sniffing capabilities, uh, credential stealing, and you can use it to further on go into the network, try to attack other um, like servers and whatever into the network. You have a foothold there. And it's very persistent because these things are dumb. They are running 24 seven all the time. So when you have a food step in there, it's like game over kind of. That's also why um, several groups 
use the source code of Tsunami, which was released in 2004. That was the earliest appearance of that. And the source code of Tsunami was released. So a lot of people just picked the source code and created their own modifications out of that. They are nowadays for many, many different platforms um, to target as well, like embedded devices. One very famous thing, it was also abused in the 2016 hack of the Linux Mint, where the build servers um, were kind of overtaken, at least the download servers, and in the ISO files of that Linux distribution, um, a tsunami backdoor was implemented, which was quite interesting and huge. Which brings me to the next step, of course. <laughs> um, in nowadays, I mean, I said the professional groups, they're using, reusing stuff as well. Uh, which is a bit different when we're talking about specifically ransomware groups, leakware, however you want to name it, sorry. The air is a bit dry. Um, but ransomware itself, it's nothing new, even though we see nowadays a lot of techniques which are completely like interesting. I have a few examples of that as well. Back in 1989, that was probably, or it was, the first kind, so to say, ransomware. That's how old this history of that stuff is. And from my perspective, it's always interesting to look a bit back and see developments and the history because sometimes it helps you understand the reality and nowadays and how things are developing and are. What we're talking about just to kind of buzzwords, big game hunting, um, which is basically going not behind everything, what we've seen in the past, like this mass infection um, of uh, random computers, whatever. These groups nowadays are more targeted, are more interested to go behind the interesting stuff where the people really have a pressure to pay or where there's juicy data, which can also be leaked. That's also following to the encrypt and leak, so you have the double side effect, basically. The groups nowadays are very more professional going on. I um, mapped it with the uh, MITRE attack framework, just as a reference. So there are a lot of different um, steps involved into that, so we're not talking like back then where it was just one person creating something, distributing, spreading, whatever. Um, but we have certain levels of how these groups operate and try to get into networks and do their main goal, which is like the double um, side of things, uh, leak and um, encrypt to put more pressure on. That's also how the groups operate, very distributed. You have a lot of different people with different core competences implemented. Uh, recent leaks also proved this again, but we also have seen this previously because uh, a lot of communication, a lot of like also outsourcing is happening there. Uh, for example, this point of initial access, their marketplace is just focused on the initial access, where people who has initial access to certain networks and whatever, selling them to other actors in order to like, when they can do their attacks, which may be either ransomware groups for doing their kind of stuff, or also for more way more professional actors uh, in order to help them doing espionage operations or whatever. So that's this thing with the, um, um, big game operation and there are many many different groups um, I put it in the uh, yeah in the frame of what we are seeing nowadays because we have something going on everybody's aware of that and especially here very famous Conti coming group stormers lockbit uh, ransom groups where they're also nowadays positioning themselves in a political sphere which was completely uh, new at least to some extent um, before they were just yeah they were even talking together in certain underground forums and stuff like that which uh, is quite an interesting uh, way to use their power also for political methods 
Which brings me a bit further. The political implement ca uh, implications are one next step. But we have these, besides the professional groups, which are more interested into money and whatever, there is more. There is these big tips, uh, the APTs. And before we dig into that a bit more, um, some background. Um, there are different kind of operations which were going on, which we have observed, which we have investigated, uh, besides the espionage attacks, which is very common level in that area, also certain cyber sabotage operations, and of course mass manipulations, what we are also seeing nowadays. Uh, some of them include malware, just to give you a brief overview where to point something at. The methods, I already said it uh, with the uh, uh, ransomware groups, you have this initial vector. And the initial vector, how to gain and enter a network and the target, is a very critical point. That's why um, several groups also used and abused the so-called supply chain. There were many big examples of that, just to give you a few, because they're outstanding each by itself. And that's also one of the main things I hope you take away. Um, it's not just another supply chain attack. It's not just another group. They have all their specifics. The methods are very specific for a certain operation, for a certain group. Uh, with Netsarang, for example, that was quite interesting. It's a server management software. And for being active after the infection, they were using the uh, a set TXT record in the uh, DNS. When for a certain domain, which is derived from the month and the year, based through an uh, algorithm, they query the domain, and if the TXT record of that domain is set, the malware gets active, which is quite an interesting method. CC Cleaner, uh, which was abused uh, with implemented malware, Millions of people were infected, but the second stage was only delivered to about 40 targets. So all of these millions of devices reported back to the C2 server and only handfully picked at interesting targets, especially in the high-tech area and the IT segment, were selected and uh, received the second stage. So it's not only always about everything which is possible, but these groups operate targeted and specific. They don't want to go to the mess. They have their goals, they have their plans, and they just use certain methods in order to get into that. Um, NotPedia, that's an interesting part because that was a very destructive one. NotPedia was this um, first observed as a ransomware, which later out uh, turned that it's not a, a ransomware, but a, a wiper. Crystal Finance develop, uh, um, finance Millennium development, uh, development thing, uh, which delivered soils and ransomware. Interesting, I said, I have a few examples, just to give you an overview that they are different things. Havix was distributed through Trojanized installers, targeted ICS systems. Shadowhammer abused the ASUS Live Update utility. Uh, Xcode, that was a very, very nasty one, because when you were infected with that and you were using Xcode, for example, for development, of course, for iOS apps, during the compilation only, you couldn't see the source code in Xcode. During the... Uh, the compilation, the malicious code was injected into the build app. So you had no control about it. You couldn't see it. It was not in your source code, project files, whatever. And one of the biggest ones, or probably the biggest one, definitely was SolarWinds, um, where this uh, server um, and infrastructure man uh, management uh, system was abused to deploy malware. These are just a few examples, but each one of them had their own specifics and how they were used and abused. 
which is a bit different to the more common ones like proxy lock on lock for shell which were abused by many many different actors uh really that popped up and increased every day after they were released and some of these yeah vulnerabilities abused by them are also kind of oh that's why i put this example of this firmware updater the vulnerability in there was 12 years old and that's always why you have to think and be aware of your supply chain, what you're using, what you're implementing, where are the connections. Um, there is no 100%, so just think about that. The not petty I just mentioned before, I said it's it was a wiper, and that's going into this destructive stuff. Besides the espionage, sabotage operations, where just data or whole um, file disks are wiped completely, you don't have access to anymore whatsoever. That's just an example of one very old wiper from 2012, um, just to visualize it a bit, what it means having a wiper. Anyone remembers that? <laughs> so that's basically uh, a YAR rule with the matches of the similarity between Black Energy Kill Dist uh, Wiper and the uh, NotPedia, which I just mentioned before. So we also have links there. You see this throughout the whole presentation. I always show sometimes some links between uh, things I mentioned because that's interesting learning from the past and seeing certain developments, matches, similarities, in order to also do kind of technical attribution and, and uh, dig more into this whole operation which is probably going on. NotPetya especially was quite interesting, uh, which is shown here in this uh, IDA screenshot, where Basically, the idea, when you have a ransomware, you get an ID. This ID is used for encryption. You have to give it to that group uh, in order to get the, like, the decryption key. And NotPetya tried to implement basically the same. Therefore, most of the people first thought that it's just another ransomware account, so to say. Um, but the ID and the comparison was completely random, so there was no way at all in the world no way to do any kind of decryption later on again so it was a wiper nowadays if you just follow the news a bit so i also added this um what's happening right now we're just popping up a lot of new wipers um being active in, in certain regions especially in ukraine and even though there are just so many different new names each one has very specific abilities. They're not related to each other. They don't share like the code and how things are wiped. So for example, WhisperGates uh, overrides the MBR overrides files. Hermetic Viper has a very complex NTFS parsing implemented and also first tries to fragment the data. So usually on Windows, you do defragmentation in order to like have all the files uh, be kept together on the blocks. This one does exactly the opposite. So when it's wiping and you still try to do some forensic investigations in order to recover some data, with more fragmented data, it's way more difficult, nearly impossible to recover anything compared to something which is like defragment and uh, completely on disk. Isaac Wiper overrides disks with random data. This one focuses more on files. Completely different operation. Something completely unrelated to each other. So it's not just another wiper. That that was also something which 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 was a bit sad that the reports are always there. Now it's a second wiper, now it's a third wiper, now it's the fourth wiper or whatever. Each one of them has a very unique characteristic from the technical perspective. And because of that, if you're aware of that, you are better prepared in order what to do. Trying to override a whole disk takes way longer, it's way more aggressive from the IOs, so you know better what to do here in, uh, compared to like just files uh, or uh, fragmentation operations. Completely different things, technically. 
And if you're not able to like um, understand it and see it because you don't have the information, it's way more difficult to defend against that. And that's why it's important to look at the details of all of these operations going on. Let's go a bit to more, not easy stuff, but espionage. We have destroyed already a lot. Um, a very famous example of very, very high-tech used was definitely Satellite Tola. It's a group active for a long time. And it's just, I just tried to showcase you that it's not only the easy or weird ways like Exif, C2 communication, DNS stuff, uh, but sometimes also the communication channels may be completely off whatever where you have control about it or what you can observe about it. Um, here, it, it's a very complex uh, thing if you're not into satellite communication. Back then, you basically had the um, data transmission through a satellite and then a back channel through the landline. Nowadays, you have like also two-way communication on satellites. Um, and because of the broadcasting, you can easily hide super OPSEC, hide the attacker and the actors behind that. And it's very more e uh, difficult to block any kind of this communication when it's like broadcasted over certain areas. Others, and that's also why I <laughs> tried to explain you that learning from the technical aspects, because the attackers do that as well. And one of the most prominent ones was um, Project Sauron, which was learning from a lot of other actors and operations, the technical details, copy-pasting it. Not, definitely not uh, as first place, at least as it's seen, to just uh, try to be a false flag operation, but to use these techniques to be more successful in the operation. Some try to copy paste certain strings, certain operation methods in order to like false flag. Yeah, if you say, if you can pretend you're actor B, but in reality you're actor A, it's easier for you to like hide uh, your whole operation, everything. But learning from others in order to advance your techniques you're using. That's like a different level. And here it was documented because we could see and uh, trace it back. And it's very likely that a lot, especially on the professional groups, we've seen that as well, that they are learning from other advanced attacks and operations and trying to use similar methods, similar techniques in their operations to be more successful, to advance and be more sophisticated. That's also why we have to learn. We have to learn and know the technical details and specifications in order to be better protected. It's not just a one-time operation of the same techniques may be used by other groups as well again. A completely opposite example is something which we're seeing also nowadays. Gamma Redden is very active um, at this current uh, situation. And Gamma Radon is quite interesting. Um, the group exists since about 2013, whatever, and they are still using just low tech. No zero days, no super advanced stuff. Uh, they have their infection um, uh, stages with like old known stuff like the LNK, PowerShell, schedule tasks, VB scripts, whatever. Very, very low tech, but they're super successful as well. For example, they're using uh, this desktop ENI method since uh, 2017 already. It's just they stick to their low tech, nothing advanced. So you also have the attackers and operators on the other side of the technological chain. It's difficult to say here advanced because the technical aspects are not really advanced, but they're effective. They're still working. So you have to take care about all areas, not just the most advanced, not the most crazy satellite communication, whatever kind of stuff, 
or very strange wipers, defragmentation, whatever, um, but also about the low-tech stuff. Low-hanging fruits. That simple. Maybe often overlooked, I don't know, because they are successful with that. Still, nowadays, right now, as we're talking. More advanced stuff, and that's something which is sometimes said, um, which is very, very difficult to defend against it. That's why I mention it. Um, because here we're not talking directly about noise. There is no much noise where it's difficult to put a sensor on. And I guess everybody here is aware of like the uh, um, usual execution rings. Yeah, you have uh, user space, you have the kernel space, but there are also the minus levels, the stuff which is below the operation system. Some of them are still, let's say, theoretical stuff, but we also have seen already several successful attacks. Uh, in the UEFI, for example, Mosaic Regressor um, was an implant into the UEFI, and we're not talking about the ESP, the EFI system partition on a disk. We're talking about the EFI on the SPI flash ROM on the mainboard. Hardware. You can reinstall, you can change the disk whatsoever, as long as you have this mainboard, the stuff is there. That kind of stuff. Um, Mosaic Regressor um, had an implementation with certain drivers um, going into uh, the EFI boot chain, um, dropping into the Windows operation system and the startup folder a file, which was then executed every time you boot up the system. You can reinstall, you can change the disk, as I said before, no chance. The next level, which was more advanced, is Moonbounce, because they did they did it more technically advanced on the level that they directly went into the DXE. They put an implant into the DXE itself and not interacting with that, which is like the core, one of the core modules of the OEFI. And they didn't drop a file just for execution. The whole operation on the Windows system was fileless, no traces on this, and was just operating in memory. So have your stuff ready to also check all of that stuff. As well on the SPI, SPI is tricky. Like this is really, really low level. Low, 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 low level. So you have to have specific, we have a scanner for that, uh, which is uh, a firmware scanner, um, which we also use in these investigations in order to detect that and extract that firmware and go into the investigation. But this is something which probably not everybody really has um, in their mind under scope. And this is something you usually don't care about because this is really low level. But this is a, a persistence level 1 million, right? Exchange all your mailbots. No, you don't. <laughs> Uh, the problem here is for both of them, it's not really clear how the initial infection vector happened um, because in this specific case, you could only see it afterwards when you read out the SPI and dig into the firmware when you have a certain, um, yeah, when you think that there is something wrong because also this kind of investigation, it's not something you're just doing easily, right? you really have to get your hands on. It's nothing you can scale up in your network for a thousand computers easily. Um, that's why this persistence method is like really um, advanced and complicated. In the end, with all that, what can we do? We're not lost, completely not. I don't, I'm very optimistic and that's also why usually when I talk to like regular 
um, non deep tech people. I'm not the bad guy. I don't want to create fear, anger, whatever. Um, I'm a positive guy. I'm an optimist. We need to exchange all of that information in order to defend because we have the abilities to. We just need to be aware. And the awareness is the most important thing, first of all, because if you're not aware of how can you start defending against. So one tool which is very ex uh, essential, of course, you may have a lot of tool chains, that's okay. Um, but one core tool, of course, is Yara because it really helps a lot with uh, hunting and also trying to find the similarities what I just mentioned before. And I just wanted to give one other example because it was very famous and also very interesting from a technical perspective. Um, the name already says it, WannaCry. Um, so the upper one is WannaCry, the lower one is... Right, correct. Um, so that's exactly uh, the link which was uh, tweeted um, by that uh, employee from uh, Google. And when we had a look at, you could see that this is uh, the code parts of a custom SSL implementation, which basically shows a link uh, between these two operations. And if you just remember all the other similarities and things I showed you before, this is something to go for as well, because it's always good to put in links, to learn, to see the similarities, to follow the traces, because then maybe you can get even more intelligence out of and know what to defend against probably, and what to do, maybe who's hunting you or who's going after you. There are a lot of different methods. I just try to put it like as simple as possible into a small overview just for you to take away probably most of that most of you people are already doing uh, what you can do in terms of data enrichment because that's an essential part um, that's the technical side of things then going into uh, the uh, Mitre Tech framework, for example, for the methodologies, getting more intelligence about how certain operations are conducted, who are maybe certain groups or operations which are going on in order to be on top and protect and defend, right? That's basically what we are up to. In the end, some last words. Don't underestimate the human factor. Um, these are photos I've taken myself. I'm flying quite often, also here I came by plane. And when you go into the business lounges there at airports, people in that level may not always be super aware or know what security means. Um, so this picture basically is, I think it was in Frankfurt or Munich in the business lounge. And one guy in a suit, he just stood up, he left his notebook. You can see it's open. Um, the screen is from Outlook. He was connected through VPN. He had some emails open and he went to the restroom. Not just to wash the hand and be back in 30 seconds. Even 30 seconds is like way too long. But he really, I was sitting next to that. I sat down and was waiting for him to come back. It was nearly 15 minutes. Imagine what you can do with an open notebook in 15 minutes. So, of course, as technicians, I am technician, we can do a lot of things, protecting the network, fighting against super crazy technical stuff because that's fun, right? That's driving. But in the end, we also have to take into account that there are humans in the end on the other side of the notebooks, which may not be that deep technical as we are, may not have the understanding and knowledge what we have. So we have to do something about that. We have to train them. We have to put the right settings. And this is also, it's, it's not only a question about training, by the way. It's, I'm not a big fan of just blaming the user. That's a wrong way. Blaming the user, wrong way. Not good. You have to take them with you. And you can do security policies. Screen lock, for example. There was no screen lock. 
the screen didn't lock after two minutes, whatever, inactivity or whatever. No, it was completely on for nearly 15 minutes. That same way. It's not only a problem about, about user. It's a problem of, about wrong security policies as well. There are many, many different methods you can use. Employees, as I just said before, advanced technologies, management, vulnerability tracking. I said it was the supply chain attacks. Um, really, go into your stuff. Be aware of what's going on. Um, it's not always as simple, I know it, but the tools are there. It's not that we have to fight with like bare hands against a beer. We have all the tools and technologies. You just need to use them in the right way. You have to get them and use them. Next time, maybe I'm talking about some other devices I have at home. I have a huge rack full of that. And if you liked it, please follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions here or I'm still down at the, uh, we have a booth. Um, I'm around there, outside, whatever. Feel free to ping me. Thanks. And... So we definitely have a few minutes for questions. So if anybody has some questions, I'll pass the mic around. I'm super good in time. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the presentation. It's a really interesting topic. You, in one slide, you saw uh, what is the percentage of APTs in the attack. I think in the attacks, I think it was like 0.01%. But from those, uh, how many of them are really, really interesting? As you saw at the at the end of the presentation, because there are some groups like Duku, Equation, or Gauss that are really highly uh, technically speaking, they are very interesting. But I'm probably sure that most of them are almost like crap software. So how many, or more or less, how many of those are pretty interesting technically speaking? Uh, to be honest, many of them, if not all of them, because each group develops mm -hmm. their own techniques, their own methods. And as I said before, some groups learning from other groups. This is not only on the APT level, this is on all levels. Also professional attackers, crime work groups, whatever, trying to learn from the big guys. And therefore you have to learn and go through all of the techniques used, which are public, because if you know about it, the attackers may also about it and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So all of them are interested. All of them is something to go through. When we're talking about security, it's not only, ah, this is just someone attacking, I don't know, political institutions and you're in a pharmacy or whatever. No, because these techniques may be used the next day against your operation as well. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. What a question. Hi. Very nice talk, by the way. Thanks. So, um, I was really interested in the moon phase, uh, and especially like the, the motivation of your talk, which is discerning signal by noise. So, the attack seems like extremely sophisticated. So, how do you guys like try to spot this? I mean, if you are on the user level, how do you understand this ex executing just in RAM? Or if you try to instrument the firmware, how do you understand it? Is, it scale escalates so up there, you know? It's like, it seems very semantically difficult to actually understand what is going on. And the, the following question is how, how uh, this thing helps, how it spreads, you know? Like, is someone working for ASUS which actually uh, does this? I mean, I said ASUS, I can say whatever, but do you understand what I mean, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first of all, it is really tricky to know or identify such attacks. Uh, you have to work a lot of with anomalies. I mean, memory you can scan if you do it. You have to do it. That's the simple point. And then you also have at least that point of communication. Communication is also very tricky um, because at, at some points 
they may need to talk to some C2. The problem is nowadays uh, most of the infected devices do not necessarily directly talk to a C2, but they may talk to other relays in the same network and then use just one hub, for example, in order to communicate to the C2. So the whole situation also on the communication level and the network is very complex. So you have to do a lot of monitoring. And that's always the key. Monitoring. Monitor as much and everything as possible. Store it and try to find exactly these links. I know it, so it sounds not easy, but it is. It's just tapping. It's just storing all the information and then trying to match it. Get threat intelligence providers, which deliver a lot of enrichments, like that was one of the last slides, enrichments, and then try to make sense all of the data. That's exactly the point. Try to find these signals, and that's, first of all, store data. Many, many do exactly that not. They don't store the data. They don't have enough sensors and monitoring installed. So they don't know and are not able to tell what's really going on in the networks and on the computers. And that's the first thing to start with. And then advance that. Do the monitoring. Have kind of a SOC. If you're too small, get a managed SOC. No problem. And then advance on that. And then you have the abilities at least to know that there's something strange. And when you know that there's something strange, you can go on. There are researchers, there are DFU guys who just come investigate and they have the capabilities to go into that, like SPI, for example, and check that. Nobody needs to be able to do that in, an, in, a, in, a, uh, in a corporation. You can have external experts for that, no problem. Other questions? Find me later if you have any. Exactly. There's another round of applause for Marco. Thanks.